Welcome back to the Yield Foundry, ladies and gentlemen. I don't even know if you can see me right now. I'll tell you what, I'll go ahead and work you around that way. Okay, I have a little project that I'm going to work on. It's going to be for me once it is finished. What I need is a wrapping tool, okay? I've got, I've got most everything else that I can think of I need to make my job easier in molding, okay? I just don't have a real good wrapping tool. Now, half the time on the ship, we'd wind up using a, a uh, you know, crescent wrench. Small crescent wrench. It was heavy enough that it gave a little bit of weight and you could open up the jaws enough to where you could give yourself a good wrap. But one of the fellas or ladies, I can't remember who did it, that worked in the foundry had somebody down up in the pattern shop make a pattern for us and we cast one and it looked a lot like this, okay? If you've got, all right, where is it? If you've got a pattern that's fairly large and you need to add some uh, real good uh, wrapping pressure to it, you would have this, we'll pretend that's a wrapping tool, and you would hit it like that. If you had one that's a little delicate, like had filigree in it or small letters in it that you didn't want to hit it a lot, but you still wanted to clear, some of the um, you know the space around around the item you're making you would just use something like that and it would give just the right amount well I could keep one like this you know it's made out of plastic it'd be lightweight I could keep that I don't anticipate though that I'll be using uh, really tiny you know making tiny little stuff what I did do though is that when I, I made this first with the intention of ramming this up, you know, and cutting my gates, in gates, and all that stuff, but I said, hey, I've got a 3D printer now. I bought it in, for the intent, intended purpose of working and making patterns and such. Why not make the pattern and the runners and in gates and then splash basin and so forth and so on? And that's what I did here. Okay. Now I put it on this as well because I don't have any thin uh, plexiglass, I mean uh, plywood. But the good thing about having it in this, it's not that flexible. And you can see exactly where you need to put that, that sprue. Okay. You can place it right where you want it. And even if it moves a little bit, you'll know that it was in the area where it needed to be instead of over here or over here okay so that's what I'm making right now got my sand all ready to go uh, I think I need to get this out of the way so I don't trip over it safety's first in the foundry boys and girls ladies and gentlemen okay Never have a tripping hazard if you can ever help it. All right. So let me go ahead and I'm going to turn you so you're pointing down more and you can watch what I'm doing in here. That'll just take a second. I really, really want to uh, get it to where you can see my appearance in the film is secondary, obviously. What I want you to do is to be able to see what I'm doing. Now I will try and tell everybody a, a run a play by play of what I'm doing, but can't exactly have. I mean, I don't have so many um, cameras that I can have it from all, all angles. Okay, so make sure that everybody's, or rather the. Uh, the pattern is positioned where you'll have it completely done. Now what I have also, I had it set up. I'll go ahead and show you a little bit. Right there, I've got a lip out here, okay? What that's for, and if I didn't have this, I wouldn't have that lip there, right? It'd be just like the sides. But what I'm gonna do with this, is this is my 
my vibrator uh, to uh, you know give us clearances uh, around the around the uh, pattern so I can pull this off easy or rather pull the whole thing out easy and uh, okay get this out of the way get tools ready parting powder don't forget never forget the parting powder because you don't need any of your sand to be affixing itself to your pattern or your ram up board okay using this it's so that if there's any clumps in there or any leftovers from your last pour little beads in there you won't have that in direct contact with your pattern okay what you need is just cover everything with nice soft sand Cover everything as much as you can. Give yourself, let's say, an eighth of an inch, half inch, no, quarter inch of sand. Because the next thing you're going to do is you're going to tuck the sand. Just like when you tuck somebody in for bed. If you're a parent, you know what that's like. You tuck the people in you with the uh, covers. you got to tuck the sand in. You don't just hit it with your your rammer. Try to keep that present. You don't just take this and ram it because you're not going to get in into all the nooks and crannies. So you just take your fingers and go all over the place. First, you do it nice and light. You want to try and tack, or rather, tuck this stuff where it is you don't want to have to have everything crushed this way and crushed that way because you hit it too hard okay once you start your first layer okay the things are getting nice and firm now okay so you can do it better now you can do it a little bit more because things aren't going to be spreading out All right. What I did is I had a whole bunch of dry sand because I hadn't used it in quite some time and uh, had to redo my entire sand inventory. It was all dry. So that's why we have extra over in my little, uh, well, what do you call it, a carrying wagon or a little wagon. I want to use it first before it dries out and I have to just put it in the uh, my muller, I'll call it, for next time. Okay, I've got it more or less tucked in there pretty good now. And I've got a bunch of holes in there so I don't have to scratch it. So this will go right in all those nice little holes I made with my fingers. So you won't have a discrete layer trying to fall apart. Now if you've never, if you didn't watch my other video, I'm going to explain. You always do the, uh, the ramen with the peen end, P-E-E-N, peen end, okay? That way you'll, the, the same amount of effort that you put into that will go into a smaller area and it'll be tighter in there okay you save the butt end 
which is the flat end, for the very last level. Now, I do have to scratch this, because I did tighten that down. Now, I explained it in another video, but I'll do it again, just to not have dead silence. You scratch it so that you have uh, no discrete barrier that you would have just from your ramen, okay? You want this whole level all the way from the surface that you're touching the uh, pattern all the way to the top where you scratch it or uh, strike it off. You want that a solid total, uh, no layers, okay? You want it one big block, solid block. That way it's, it's much better when it comes to uh, strength. Some folks will just do a layer, use the butt, butt end of the uh, rammer, and one of, the, one of these days, one of those discrete layers, like the very first layer that you rammed up, will just fall out because it's not bonded with the, the succeeding layers. Okay, <clears throat> start using a little more of the other sand. Spread it out. I've already scratched it off. And you just ram it up. Okay. Now be careful not to, you know, totally put as much strength behind this as you can. What you're trying to do is you're trying to maintain the permeability of the sand. Now what I mean by that, permeability in this case, is the sand's ability to pass vapors and gases through it. Because when you pour the molten metal into this, you, you know, depending on what sand you're using, you're going to generate gas. Uh, like if you were using petrobond pan, uh, petrobond sand, you'd be generating petro uh, petrochemical gas from the oil. And uh, in this case, you're going to generate. Uh, water vapor because basically the only thing that can be affected by the uh, material I'm going to be pouring is the water. So far, because of the material that I am using, uh, you don't have to worry about the clay, which is in this case bentonite, from burning up. Uh, you would have to worry about that maybe when you start using a material that has to be much hotter. For instance, uh, I don't know, you might burn up some of your some of your clay when you're pouring a thin brass or bronze piece because the brass and bronze, its pouring range is 1950 to 2100. The 2100 might be just strong enough or hot enough for your clay to break down, burn up, turn to ash. You absolutely will burn it up if you if and when you pour any monel, steel, iron. And so just like if you were using Petrobon sand, you would have to be replacing the uh some of the constituents that you have in this sand. In this case, would, of course the water would be gone. It, the water would be totally vaporized by that great heat, but you'd have to see what it's like when you um, try to ram up and if you've got the proper amount of water in there that you know is the proper amount of water, and yet it still doesn't, doesn't form good, that means you're low on uh, uh, clay. You're low on your clay. Then you just have to 
make a good guess on how much clay you're going to have to put in there because in these circumstances unless you're in a foundry and you can you can use testing equipment that cost thousands or hundreds of dollars you're going to in this case when you're replacing the um, the clay you're going to have to do it bit by bit and uh, you know make a judgment call each time you stop uh, mulling it and see if its strength its its molding strength is uh, good enough for what you're making for instance if you were making a bell where you're going to have the inside of the bell hanging you're going to want to max out on your on your strength as best you can because I, I, I can't tell you how many times we would make a bell and as soon as we started lifting the cope that had the uh, inside of the inside form of the bell in it that that inside form you know just went pow fell out and we had to start all over again ticked you off so that's the reason why you never make the inside of the bell without having a whole bunch of other uh, mold supports and that's another video that I made mold supports are there so that they don't fall apart during the time that you have to move them around okay now this is almost full as you can see so Put a little bit more here, spread it out. Butt end. You ram it fairly hard on the butt end. Try to make sure that you, if there's any low spots, you fill it in. See, the idea is, just like when you don't put this directly on the on the ground, don't put it directly on on uh, your, you know, whatever it is on the ground. You're not going to have flat ground. There's going to be dips and. Uh, you know, you know, uneven, uneven spots on the ground, even if it's concrete. And if you have uneven spots, especially if you don't have a a, a flask that it stays in, that uh, that mold might crack. Okay, all right, it's all rammed up. Now you got to strike it off. The best striker I've ever found was a piece of angle iron, thin angle iron. You don't have to have heavy duty stuff. You just back and forth and it's cutting it and forming that part of the drag. If you're brand new to this, the bottom half of the mold is the drag. Okay, top half of the mold is the cope. All right, now, oh yeah, next thing, I'm now ready to put the bottom board on here and then flip this over and continue on, right? Well, you need to have a way for the uh, gases to be able to get out of here other than the natural permeability that you have because remember, this is going to be sitting, its entire weight is going to be sitting on a bottom board. The bottom board in this case is this now I don't see a whole lot of channels in here that's going to allow the free passage of air all right so and we're in this case vapor so what you need to do before you turn this over is vent vent this okay and the way to vent this 
that's a little thick. But this is the only thing I had on hand to be able to make a vent. It works. Okay, you go down and you don't make so many holes that you break up the integrity of your mold, but you make a lot of enough holes where the vapor can escape fairly easily. And why do you have to have the vapor escape? Well, because if the vapor stayed inside the mold cavity, the vapor would not only displace the molten metal, so you would have basically a bubble inside your casting that you didn't want, or the, the water vapor in there might be enough, it might have enough liquid or uh, condensation in there for the water to make the metal explode or turn into steam. The metal is not gonna explode. The water in there would turn into steam and the expanding steam would push the metal and well, it's almost the same thing. The metal might as well be exploding because the metal is the stuff that's gonna be going everywhere, okay? Now, you don't want this to fall. Now, I've been doing this for quite some time, so this is one of the ways that people who are experienced in turning these over can do this. If you are a newbie to this, you can either get a couple of, couple of clamps, put it on this and turn it over. You can get somebody else, uh, you can stay on this side and another person will be on the other side to help you flip this over. But, uh, well, number one, I'm, I'm by myself. Number two, I really don't need to have clamps. But I did show you in another video how to clamp this up. It's a three-clamp method, okay? To describe it, three-clamp method, you'd have two clamps. You'd clamp here on, on even spots, turn it over on its side, take one of the clamps off. Re, uh, put, rather, don't turn one of the clamps off yet. Because this, if you took the clamp off over here and this clamp was here, the pressure here would make this thing go up like that, okay? And you don't want anything to move. So, turn it sideways. You've got two clamps holding it firmly. I would put another, uh, turn it sideways, I would have another clamp here. But if the clamp, I mean, you've got to turn, you got to put the clamp on here in such a way that when you turn it all the rest of the way over, it's not going to... Uh, uh, prevent you from having this sit flat okay so if it's got long long bits right now you got two long bits turn it on its side get another one with a long bit you turn it you, you put it where when you turn it the rest of the way the long parts are going to stand be standing up uh, when you're done okay so that you know you can take those off and it'll be great all right now that I've stalled enough let's see if I can get this over without breaking anything like that okay now that was the molding board you try to keep one of your boards just for molding so you don't have digs in it and burns in it later on okay I want this over here, so I'm going to flip it around. <clears throat> okay, now here's my top or er, cope. Try a uh, cope, yeah, cope. got it marked so it comes in just a certain way and the other way it fights all right
put your parting powder on there so the sand doesn't attach itself to anything. Here's my sprue and I'll put that in as soon as I get some sand in here. Now because this doesn't have part of the pattern in the cope, all it is is just flat, you don't have to make the, uh, the uh, surface, or rather the, uh, gee my knees, I'm trying to remember, the facing sand, okay, it's, it's touching the face, facing sand is any of the nice, soft, neat, uh, sand that'll actually be touching the face of your pattern in theory okay in this case all I'm doing is just ramming up it on a flat thing the uh, surface of the plexiglass and I'm still going to tuck it though because I do want it nice and flat Part of that surface is going to be using, or rather, forming a flat surface of my um, ra rammer, or rather, wrapper, wrapping tool. Okay. Now let's find. That's where it is. Okay, there's the top of the splash basin. Okay, I put this on here, as close to the center as I can get it. I think maybe I'll go ahead and give this a little bit of, a little bit of parting powder, just to prevent anything from sticking. Okay, I've got it in place. Now this isn't going to hold it very well right this moment because I've got barely less than a quarter of an inch of sand holding it in place. easier for me to uh, hit it with my fingers, tuck it right this moment. Alright. I think I can put the rest of this in here. Okay, holding this in place, I wrapped, or rather, ran this layer up. With the peen end, of course.
Okay. Now we vent, no, we scratch. We scratch this surface so that the next surface will bond with it as, as it's supposed to. Spread it out nice and even. Then ram it, ram it up. See, even if, even after I had gotten some sand around here, it wanted to move. So keep your eyes on that. It's not really gonna go so far away from the splash basin that it, the casting won't receive any metal, but still, you do the best you can to maintain the proper way of ramming up. Scratch, scratch. And when you make when you make your uh, sprue, you want you don't need to have it sticking out of the cope six inches to a foot. All you need is enough to know where the top of the sprue is, and you can work with it. Okay. Give yourself plenty of thickness up here. Make sure you uncover your sprue so you don't go busting your sprue by hitting it. Now this portion, of course, is the last layer that you have to ram up. And so the butt end is used. Now you guys 
might be getting sick and tired of me saying all this. The ones who actually has done all this work, yeah, you absolutely going to be sick and tired of it. But don't forget, learning something, more often than not, repetition helps you remember. Okay. Later on, I might not worry about repeating everything that I do, except you got to remember where you put your stuff. Ah, there it is. That's something you got to remember all the time. Now comes time. Oops, sorry. Now comes time to strike this off. Okay, now it's one of the things you do, you just every so often I have to look at the uh, camera to make certain that I haven't used up all the battery because this would be a pain if I was to go ahead and use up all the battery, not know it, and just carry on as if you're listening. All right, there's the majority of it. Are you worrying, thinking, why is that guy all the time? sweating like that. Well, it's Florida, ladies and gentlemen. Thankfully to my wife, she wanted to stay in Florida until we die. And so we get to enjoy all this nice humid weather. Yeah, you really don't have to smooth everything down up on top. It is better that you smooth around your screw though, because part of it is going to be, uh, have to be smooth to keep the pieces from falling. All right, before you do anything else, vent. And I don't mean just scream at the camera, I mean, Give yourself some vent holes. One good thing about it being nice and quiet in here, if those, if that battery dies, it will make a noise. Gives me a warning beep. Then I can stop what I'm doing, put in a new battery. And Continue on from there. Okay. Now, we have a flask here that we're not taking off. Okay, some of the flasks you can, you got, you got seams down the middle and a hinge on the other side and you take it off and then once you put it on the deck, you put a, what's called a jacket over it, piece of metal, flat metal, that encompasses it. The, uh, the mold keeping the top half, the cope, and the bottom half, the drag, from shifting. And it also kind of stops any leakage from taking place at the parting line. Okay? But this, we don't have to worry about that. So when it comes to these, these can be cut. Actually, I did get, no, I'll use this cut a, uh, a pouring basin with an angle so that you can hit the angle
where you need to pour your metal. You don't pour your metal straight down the hole, okay? Because you're guaranteed to generate dross then. And for those of you who don't, do, do not know what dross is, it is the metal that is formed uh, in the, in the uh, material that is formed in the metal when there's a lot of tumbling and turbulence it absorbs oxygen and maybe even hydrogen and uh, it looks like some um, oatmeal at that point it doesn't look like solid metal all right I'm gonna use my little plastic wrapper it still kind of works This is how you'd be wrapping a regular pattern. Okay. This is a uh, fillet iron that the uh, pattern makers used to use. I use it to smooth, smooth out some of the angles. And the angles that I can't smooth out, I break off. Just like you guys that are machinists, one of the first things you do when you're almost done with your pattern, or rather your uh, work, is to break the edges. That's what I'm doing in here. I'm breaking the edges so that none of these edges, when they come in contact, I don't know what that noise was. When they come in contact with the metal, is that this sand doesn't just go down in with in with the uh, metal. All right, let me. Where'd I put it? Where'd I put it? There it is. I know I've got some sand grains down in there. So what I'm going to do is I want to push it into the other sand so that it doesn't get carried away. All right. Now in this case, before we take that off, because I don't want this um, this portion here to lift when I'm vibrating it, all we wound up doing. is we use a pair of vice grips. What the hell is leaking so much? A pair, of, a pair of vice grips to hold it in place. Okay. Watch, it's gonna be noisy for a sec. <laughs> is your draw spike you've got to go all the way with 360 degrees hit it all the way around that will do that automatically all right need to move this junk out of the way so that I can yeah so that I can move this stuff out of the way and Put the cope on this cart. See, it's not locked, not locked together. So, this should pick up fairly easy. Okay. And before I pick this baby up, I get as much sand out of here as I can so it doesn't fall into the mold cavity. Okay. 
Okay. Pardon me for a second, I need to find out what that noise was. Well, apparently that noise was absolutely nothing. See, I've got a uh, proper burner coming for the, uh, the furnace that I made. Uh, one of the regular burners that, that can get hot enough to melt brass and bronze, and in some cases, iron. And uh, kind of paranoid about those porch pirates. Absolutely. If I catch a porch pirate taking some of mine, they're going to have some lumps. Get her own teeth. Okay. Let's see if this baby comes out easy. And you got to pick it up straight up. And we don't really have an easy way to pick it straight up. So maybe I'll just get some of this monkey shit wherever I put it. A jar and see if that helps me at all because then I can pick it up straight up see if I can get this dusted out so the monkey shit can absolutely grip it okay you expose portion of the now this is actually called if you're going to buy it it's called duct duct seal okay in the navy on the ship we used to call it monkey shit because it's gray like monkey shit and it's sticky i'm presuming monkey shit is sticky because i've never been hit by monkey shit all right See if I can pull around. Ah, this is a little bit better. It almost looked to me like it was wanting to come apart. So I don't want that. I can repair it. That came out okay. Came out good enough that that crack on there is easily repaired. The stuff on the outside don't need to repair it really. Just uh, well, I do want to repair it some of it because some of it see that's going to represent a lot of a lot of work in taking the excess metal off like that piece i didn't want to fall away and this piece i don't want to fall away Okay, now the rest of it, give it a little bit of a, nice, a little bit, and now I'm going to, like you, you uh, machinist do, I'm going to get rid of the sharp edges, and the easiest way to do that is to do it with a very, very soft brush. And brush towards the mass of the sand. Don't brush towards the mold cavity. Because what you'll do is if there's anything loose that you didn't see before, you'll be brushing all of that into the mold cavity. All right, let's see if I can 
use the see if we have enough air to be able to remove the remainder of that sand out of the mold cavity. Right. When you do this, be extremely careful because remember your sand isn't necessarily cement, okay? ready to go that was so much faster and so much easier to uh, do it this way than to cut my own in uh, runner and and cut my own down you know splash basin and and all that stuff then it, it, it was easier to ram up the whole mold with one pattern and that's what we the uh, pattern makers were good for they made our job quite a bit easier okay uh, so, the next step would be me, let's take a look at it, get rid of any sand that might fall on the edges, because we don't want any of that to accidentally get into a mold cavity. And that's there. And before you forget, put the sprue cover on. That way, if you're going to put this on deck and you're going to uh, ram up some more. You know, molders don't always watch where that sand goes. Some of that sand could fall right down in that hole and get put into your casting and make it all a waste of time. Okay? Now, I lock it in place so I don't forget later. And it is now ready to be poured. Your next step that you're going to see is me pouring this, breaking it out, and then, uh, you know, get rid of all the excess metal uh, from the edge, the flash, and I'll have a nice, useful uh, wrapping tool. Okay? So until next time, ladies and gentlemen, and all you good old sailors and molders out there, Liberty Call. Oh, Bill, take trash out before you go. No, wait, it's Randy's turn. Randy, take the trash out before you go. <laughs>